Hey there, this is Chris Abraham, Season 3, Episode 2. Uh, my name's Chris Abraham. This is Chris Cast. Today's episode is going to be basically a download of everything that I know about guns. And I'm not going to refer to any notes, so this is just off the top of my head, from my aphantasia brain, uh, just responses to a lot of things that are being said in the media and during the uh, Kyle Rittenhouse trial online, on message boards, on forums, on the news and newspapers, uh, in articles and so forth. And this is only based on my experience and my own personal knowledge of being a, uh, a gun guy, I guess, um, having had a concealed carry permit, having gone through lots of training with regards to the best way uh, and the legal way uh, to defend yourself using a firearm against um, an assailant, an attack, an assault. And the strange things that I learned as a result. There's some really weird things that you wouldn't assume if you were not in the space with regards to what is legal. And as we find from the Rittenhouse trial, that uh, when it comes to a prosecutor, especially a prosecutor who is making his or her name, or a prosecutor who lives in a community where guns are, aren't favored, uh, none of the precedents, uh, none of the laws, none of the historical norms and values are important. Um, really, at the end of the day, if you don't have a good lawyer, and if you don't have a good plan, and if you're not smart, then um, you'll end up in jail no matter how uh, legal your use of a firearm is in a defensive situation, even if that's lethal. And I will talk to that after the break. Thanks for being here. Trigger warning, though, because I'm going to be talking about a lot of gruesome stuff. So if that bothers you, I have aphantasia, which means I don't have a mind's eye. So I do not become grossed out by seeing visions of, of gore in my head. So please, if you have, I'm not going to be gory, but I'll definitely be evocative. As anybody who knows me knows, I tend to be uh, unintentionally. I'll be right back. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. It's where I started my podcast. It's where I edited my podcast. It's where I put sound design into my podcast and it's where I monetize my podcast and it's from where I share my podcast to every single other podcast platform. It's the place that I decided is the easiest and best place for me to podcast. Thank you. Check it out. Welcome back. This is Chris Abraham, Season 3, Episode 2. This is my response to all the, all the misunderstandings, misinformations, disinformations, um, political intrigue, politicking, um, fear-mongering, and general uh, anti-white supremacy fervor. I am no in no way a supporter of white supremacy, but I do find that word being thrown around pretty liberally, if you know what I mean. So, I'm going to just jump into it. I don't have any notes or anything, so this is sort of just uh, spontaneous. But back in 2012, 2013, back in 2011, 2010, I bought my first firearm, um... It was a Glock 23 and 40 caliber ACP, and then I, you know, then I went on to buy uh, a Ruger 22 Mark 
three and all kinds of other stuff. At some point, I applied for and received my concealed carry permit for Virginia, resident Virginia concealed carry permit. That was really interesting. It required that I do a, uh, a day-long training. I went to the NRA range and had a wonderful woman train me. Uh, she thought I was a ringer because I was really quite good. And my carry weapon, my concealed carry weapon I chose was that Gen 3 Glock 23, which is considered to be a compact pistol. It, uh, it's in 40 caliber ACP, which after doing lots of research and having not known anything, I was told that a 40 caliber ACP was an awesome, awesome, the best choice round, choice round. I had no reference. I hadn't bought anything else, hadn't owned anything else. And, uh, it turned out to be a real snappy gun. It, uh, it doesn't fire. It doesn't fire like a nine millimeter or an AR fifteen. It uh, it's doable. I mean, I I responded very well to it. But just as an aside, um, I had to fight a tendency to overcompensate or flinch. So uh, anyway, now I own a Glock nineteen, which is the same sized firearm, just in nine millimeter instead of forty caliber. Um, I did really well. She passed me with flying colors. She signed the document. I went and applied to get a concealed carry permit. Uh, it Virginia is a shall carry state, which means if you apply uh, to the sheriff, in my case, the sheriff of, sheriff's office of Arlington, uh, if within 60 or 90 days uh, they can't find anything restrictive about you and your background, they must issue you a concealed carry permit. Now, that is a mixed bag. You know, if you are a conspiracy theorist and you are afraid of the man, uh, getting, a, getting a legal concealed carry permit is, uh, is a deal with the devil. Because at least in Arlington, Virginia, I needed to get a full uh, palm print. I needed to uh, get a retinal scan. I needed to do all kinds of things in order to uh, biochemically prove that I was who I was. And ironically, um, the permit is printed out on a little piece of paper uh, that you need to cut out and then laminate yourself. It's so, there's nothing, at least at that point, there was nothing at all uh, modern about it. There were no holograms and so forth. But over the course of preparing and learning and training, I learned a lot of crazy things about, uh, about firearm self-defense. Uh, firstly, there's a lot of places you can't go with a firearm. I don't drink anymore, uh, so I don't have any need to go to any bars. I also don't have a current concealed carry permit, so I gave that up a few years ago. I didn't feel like I needed it anymore. But um, you're not allowed to carry it into bars. You're not, allowed, you're not allowed to carry it in restaurants with bars unless there's more restaurant than bar. Uh, there's a lot of uh, federal buildings and schools, and there are parks that you can't bring it to. Living in Northern Virginia... Um, I'm very close to the GW Parkway. The GW Parkway uh, is DC land. So if I inadvertently, I'll talk about this later, I had a concealed carry gun, a what's called a, um, a Keltec P32, very, very tiny little mouse gun. Um, and it was easy to forget that I had it on me. And a couple times I went into DC. And if I had been pulled over or checked or whatever, I would be in jail right now. So to me, uh, the value proposition uh, for someone who would sometimes go to bars, uh, would actually eat dinner at bars, would, you know, drink at that point and end up in D.C. or Maryland and 
being, uh, I would say, two or three kilometers away from the D.C. border and uh, maybe 10 kilometers away from Maryland, uh, it was just uh, a, a booby trap waiting to be set off. And I don't want to be a felon or a misdemeanor or whatever. So I let it lapse. Um, I could get it again now. I don't actually go into D.C. ever, and I don't go into bars or schools or anything else. So, I mean, it's really moot. But uh, I learned a lot of things that you can and can't do uh, with firearms. And I'll tell you after the break. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. My name's Chris Abraham, Chris Cass, Season 3, Episode 2, Firearms and Kyle Rittenhouse. So, I'm only going to come from a point of view of concealed carry and home defense. Um, One thing I was taught with regards to uh, concealed carry self-defense, at least in Virginia, is that you do not... There's no proportionality, which is to say that if I'm walking down the street and you aggressively put hands on me to the point where I feel threatened for my life, um, let's say you're as big as me or I have, uh, you know, I'm older and you're younger or um, uh, you've thrown a punch or I've seen you aggressive to someone else or any type of uh, behavior that I think can result in in hurting me in a big way, um, I can I can use deadly force. Uh, they say that guns are an equalizer for a reason. There's no expectation, as the prosecutor suggested, that if someone comes at you with fists, there's no expectation that you put down your firearm and engage in fisticuffs. If you feel like your life is being threatened. If someone starts, to, if someone punches you in the shoulder, if someone um, starts charging you, if someone, anything, anything, uh, even potentially slapping you in the face, anything like that, you have to make your judgment call. But um, but you are you are within your right if someone gets physical with you. And this is proven again and again by the FBI that far more people die as a result of punching and kicking than ever die uh, from firearms violence or or knife violence or bat violence or skateboard violence or whatever. So the first thing is uh, you can bring a gun to a fist fight. Uh, the second thing, which is really startling, is that there's no expectation that if you do use a firearm you need to fire for effect, you need to fire for a limb, that you need to, there's no expectation that you need to fire to wing or to injure, there's no expectation that you need to shoot him in the leg, like uh, Joe Biden says, and not only that, but there's no expectation that you fire only once. The law of the land is you fire as many rounds as is required to neutralize the threat and then not one more. So uh, let's say I'm carrying uh, the Glock 19. The Glock 19 carries, I believe, 15 9mm bullets in the magazine and one in the chamber. So that would mean 16 rounds. Um, What they tell you to do and they tell you not to do anything besides this, is that because when you're in an altercation, your body freaks out, you start going into uh, hypoxia, you start start, uh, 
going into a type of shock. Uh, you, uh, your, your nerves freak out, and you rely fully on muscle memory. So they, first of all, recommend that you train and train and train and train and train until your body knows what to do with a firearm in a defensive situation without needing to have use any fine muscle skills which is why they tell you to always make sure that you have a shell in the chamber you have a bullet in the chamber and you're not required to cycle or rack the slide before firing because the way a person responds in a situation like that, fine motor skills are gone. You need to rely on, on greater motor skills and muscle memory and training. So they tell you that. Then they tell you that uh, shooting someone in the head is malicious intent. So they tell you, legally speaking, do not shoot someone in the face or the head. That shows malicious intent. Then they tell you, do not fire more rounds than is required to neutralize the threat. Then they tell you, uh, only shoot center mass. Now, center mass, if you can imagine it in your mind, it is, uh, I would say, exactly the part of your body that the Superman S is, right? The Superman S is basically center mass. It is from your, uh, it is from um, where your ribs, uh, from your ribs all the way up to your collarbone. Uh, it's the area completely where your lungs and your heart would be, uh, basically your rib cage. Um, that would be center mass. And the reason why they say that is that in a time of trauma, you, your targeting, your aiming is going to be uh, very much compromised. And your goal is to be able to hit a target that is as big as a paper dinner plate. So there's not an expectation that you shoot the tiny little groups that you do and you're shooting at paper targets at the range. There's only expectation that you hit somewhere in the general vicinity of the center of the chest, i.e. where uh, the Superman S is. That is called center mass. Um, and not any more times than is required to neutralize the person, which is to say, put them on the ground and they stop their pursuit of you. Um... That also means, neutralize also means that they turn tail and run. You don't fire, you don't continue firing at someone as they, as they um, exit stage left, stage right, or whatever. Um, another thing they tell you is that in a time when you are going to be held in account in a trial, you need to make sure you really consider your ammunition. Now, let me talk about ammunition. I will talk to a about ammunition after the break. See you in a second. I hope this is interesting. Welcome back. This is Chris Cass, Season 3, Episode 2, uh, Guns in the Age of Kyle Rittenhouse. So let's talk about ammunition. So I used an M16 A, A1 
when I was in JRTC. I used it a lot. Um, so I'm very familiar with the, um, with the, uh, how the M16 works. So that is a perfect analog for the AR-15 sporting rifle. Uh, so I know how, uh, you rack, uh, the bolt. I know how that you cycle the bolt. I know that I know everything about that firearm short of owning one or using one uh, in the current iteration. But I've never considered it to be a, a defensive firearm for myself, so I will only use um, the decisions I made when I uh, was a concealed carrier. So... And a home defense guy, too. So another thing they tell you is that the prosecutor is always going to... So this is always... Everybody does everything that they can in order to mitigate a future where, heaven forbid, this happens. And I will talk about avoidance. I, so, okay, bef well, I'll talk about ammunition first. There are... Um, I guess there's three types of ammunition, maybe four or five. But the three most common are... Um, like your little 22s, most 22s have a copper coating, but most 22s are pretty much uh, pretty much lead. So all they are is lead bullets. Some of them have hollow points, some of them have round tips, but they're all lead. Um, big uh, big rounds like uh, uh, larger, I guess lever action gun rounds and more old-fashioned rounds, um, big lever action or f revolver type of rounds, like uh, old forty-five type of calibers, they'll often have what are called wad cutters. Uh, wad cutters are just giant big blocks of lead with hollow tips, but they're not hollow points. They're decidedly, they're decidedly. Um, wad cutters they're they're made of lead and there's no covering to them there's no um jacket if you will so the type of most common rounds for modern firearms like an ar-15 or a nine millimeter glock 19 like uh uh like grosskreutz was was carrying there are generally two types. There's like a couple extras, but they're outliers. These weird bullets, these brass bullets with like little pluses in the front of them and all these other things. But there's generally what's called a jacketed, um, sorry, a, um, a full metal jacket, FMJ, full, full metal jacket round. It's also called ball ammo. It's also called target ammo. Um, it is the most common stuff that you find at, uh, at, um, gun ranges. And it's the only ammo in all states where you're allowed to use a gun, uh, including New Jersey, including California, including Hawaii. If you're a licensed gun owner, uh, you are always allowed to buy and possess ball ammo, which is a uh, full metal jacket. Full metal jacket ammo is also the ammo used by NATO because the Geneva Convention, I believe it was the Geneva Convention, I believe it was a different convention. Hold on. Hey, Google, what convention prohibited the use of hollow points in war? Here's a summary from the website thetrace.org. Hollow points are commonly used by police and civilians. They are banned in international warfare under the 1899 Hague Convention's early laws of war that the United States has followed even though the U.S. government never ratified the agreement. So, internationally, hollow points, jacketed hollow points, which the they'll... Website, the trace stop, stop, stop. They stop. Say, while hollow points are commonly used by police and civilians... They hey, Google, stop. So, they were talking about two types of weapon, uh, two types of bullets. They were talking about um, full metal jacket. Uh, that is basically the kind of round that you get at the um, at the gun shop. You get it at Walmart and so forth. 
that is the most common ammunition. That's, that's the kind of ammunition when you buy bulk ammo. That's the kind of ammunition you get when you get the cheap ammo. Um, that's the kind of ammunition you get when you get surplus ammo. Um, it is the standard bearer of ammunition. It is basically, I believe, a lead core with a uh, copper or brass uh, jacket. Now, more controversial is the jacketed hollow point or hollow point. That has been called all kinds of things like the cop killer. They call, sometimes they call it the wad cutter, even though that's not what it is. They call it the cop killer. That is, in fact, a copper or brass, uh, uh, like just like a jacketed hollow point, except in, at the front of the bullet, the jacket is sliced off and it is, uh, there's a cup. And if you look in the cup, you can see um, the lead inside and it has a jacket, and then around the lip of the opening, there are indents. And the reason why the jacketed hollow point was designed so that when you fire a bullet at a at a deer or at a at a, an attacker, that bullet will not go right through like a, a full metal jacket would. Um, it will do, do three things. It will not over-penetrate, and that is what a lot of people think about, especially when they're in apartment buildings or cheaply made houses. I want a bullet that does not go through my intended target, through the walls, and into my neighbor's house or into my uh, family's rooms. So they oftentimes choose hollow points or jacketed hollow points in order to prevent over penetration and you'd be surprised how far a um, a full metal jacket round can go it is not a an armor piercing round any bullet can go through a car door um, cars Unless you're standing behind the engine block, cars do not stop bullets like they do in the movies. Um, so the second thing that a jacketed hollow point does is it blooms. It expands. It doesn't explode. It expands, but it goes, let's say uh, my forty caliber round is forty caliber, which is around 10 millimeter in diameter. 10 millimeters in diameter which is a centimeter, right? Centimeter is 10 millimeters. One centimeter bullet uh, will expand to be a two or three centimeter. Uh, I would say now actually more like two, two and a half centimeters total after it blooms. It's called a bloom because it kind of opens up like if you've ever seen cotton, uh, open up, or or if you've ever seen a um, anyway, you should look it up. But it 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 expands, and that expansion um, delivers kinetic energy. It does two things. It delivers the full amount of the kinetic energy into the target. Uh, it also stops the over penetration. Uh, most Full metal jacket. Most full metal jacket rounds go 18 to 24 inches into gel. This is ballistic gel. 18 to 24 inches into ballistic gel, and most um, jacketed hollow points go 8 to 12 to 14 inches into ballistic gel. Uh, ballistic gel is, uh, I don't know. It's like it's like kinetic jello. It's like gelatin. So, uh, so it does, it, it also creates, and that's why they said explode. It creates an enormous wound channel. You can just imagine that if you fire a bullet into a body and the moment it hits tissue, it expands to twice, if not more its size. And then 
uh, it doesn't it doesn't just hydrodynamically or aerodynamically go through the body, but it stops, it expands, and it continues mo moving forward, delivering all the foot per pound uh, payload of that, the number of grains, the weight of the bullet, plus the muzzle velocity, etc., etc., directly into that into that body. So it can be extremely devastating, and it's much less survivable. Um, the first thing that a uh, that a doctor or a paramedic does is look to see whether or not there's an exit wound in a gunshot victim. And very rarely, if you use a f jacketed hollow point, will there ever be a, an exit wound because all of the kinetic energy, um, and, and not only that, but the, um, the expanded blossomed bullet does not always stay intact. So it could also break apart into uh, a number of pieces as well. So the, uh, the trauma associated with a jacketed hollow point is always much worse than with a full metal jacket round. That said, uh, the, the military designed the M16 so that when a light little uh, 5.56 slash 223, a light, light little, um, I mean, I know they say that this is a big gun. There's certainly a lot of power in what's called the cartridge, but the bullet is 223, which means the bullet is the same diameter as a 22 caliber long round, long rifle round. So it's an extremely small little bullet, but if uh, it was designed so that when it hits uh, when it hits tissue, when it hits a target, it, it it tumbles. And that tumbling does the same thing that a hollow point does, which is it it uh, it dumps all of the kinetic energy and it also um, it spins like a top, so that creates uh, extremely violent, potentially extremely violent wound channels. And, you know, there are um, rumors or lies about someone who was shot in the toe and the bullet came out of the top of their head because it just, it uh, tumbled throughout their body. But I don't believe that that's true. The, uh, maybe that was the gun that shot JFK but that's not a normal thing to happen. In fact, hollow points are complete. Let's say you had a hollow point in your revolver and you ended up on the Jersey Parkway and a cop pulled you over. In fact, if you have a hollow point bullet in your trunk, rolling around your trunk because you uh, accidentally forgot it there, when you lived in West Virginia and you went to the range and you practiced on your defensive round, but you don't have any guns in the car, but there is a hollow point in your trunk, you will be, that is a huge offense in New Jersey. So, um, full metal jacket rounds are just not armor piercing and they're not, uh, they're not any more murderous uh, than the person murdering. Um, it's not especially traumatic, uh, except for the fact that all bullets, anything entering the body is traumatic, but it doesn't create the kind of wound channel, the kind of trauma, and the kind of mayhem that a jacketed hollow point does. So, um, on the other hand, the when I was trained in terms of what firearms to, what, what, what to, what ammunition to carry in my concealed carry pistol, um, there are, there are a lot, there's a lot of advice. So the first advice is whether or not it's winter or summer, right? So, uh, when someone is wearing a full winter kit, you know, wool and sweaters and jackets and so forth. Uh, if you have like my little 
Caltech P32, they recommend that you um, carry a ball ammo, you carry full metal jacket, because a little 32 caliber pistol might not fully penetrate all of that clothing and the jeans and jean jackets and all that other kind of stuff. So in the summer when everybody's wearing t-shirts and so forth, uh, my P32, I might put jacketed hollow points in there. Um, but okay, in terms of what, what ammunition to choose as a concealed carrier or as an open carrier, they tell you to call the local precinct of your police department and to make sure that you buy the type of ammunition that your local police uh, department uses. That's because a prosecutor is always looking for um, intent to kill or malicious intent or um, a murderous vibe or itching to kill or vindictiveness or looking for an excuse to kill somebody um, and custom, uh, certain types of customization to your gun, uh, bringing your gun out of OEM, which is original, uh, uh, the way it came out from the factory, uh, choices of ammunition and so forth are all things that, you know, for example, let's say you had a Punisher tattoo on your shoulder, or um, there's a part in your, the back of your, um, of, of a Glock where you can replace a little flap with uh, something customized. Let's say you had your gun engraved and it was called the Punisher or you have it, uh, you have like something on it that says, kill them all, let God sort them out. Or you have some references to the Boogaloo Boys or anything in the world that makes it look like your firearm isn't your choice of last resort can work towards losing you a case. Now, after we um, go through this, this break, I will talk about best practices and why Kyle Rittenhouse was out of his mind and why uh, nobody who's a concealed carry person uh, does any of those things and the kind of ethos that concealed carry people uh, have and also the uh, agreement, the tacit or no, the explicit agreement that concealed carry holders have when it comes to at least being in Virginia, what the the, the agreement that we make and pledge uh, to uh, the sheriff's department of Arlington, and I'll get back to you in a second. So I mentioned that uh, shooting is your last resort. Um, to that point, there's a lot of things that... Oh, this is Chris Cass, Season 3, Episode 2. This is guns in the... Uh, concealed carry, carry guns in the uh, Kyle Rittenhouse age. My name's Chris Abraham, and I'm going to be talking about... Um, like, best practices, I guess, in terms of the gun game. If you're going to be a concealed carrier, an open carrier, whatever, I'm going to talk about concealed carry because there's loads of really super sneaky things that you get into an agreement with with with, with regards to the sheriff. So you sign all the you sign an agreement to this, which is um, nobody can know, nobody can know you're carrying. You can't tell anybody around you. You can't uh, advertise it. You can't telegraph it. You can't. Uh, in fact. Um, in the agreement, you have to carry on your body uh, in a way that your firearm does not print. And print, by definition, is to uh, show a visible outline. It's never exposed. Um, and you certainly can never use your carrying as a, as a way of flexing in any way. Not a way of threatening, not a way of... You know, like they have heavies in TV shows, you know, when the 
when the heavy goes ahead and opens up his jacket and shows that he's carrying as a method of intimidation. In fact, there are sundry, sundry um, criminal laws of things you can't do as a concealed carry holder. Which is to say, the agreement that you make is that nobody knows you're carrying until the exact moment that you need to uh, discharge your firearm in defense. So it doesn't even give a heads up to uh, the person attacking you, right? So let's say uh, someone wants to mug me on the street. Um, let's say someone wants to mug me on the street. If I see that person and if I see a shadowy person coming towards me in the middle of the night, I'm out uh, and my first obligation is try to avoid which is to say, you know, take a turn, double back, uh, enter a, a restaurant, go into a store, uh, go into a convenience store, um, hail a taxi. Um, so that's avoid. The second thing I try to do is to evade. Uh, in other words, try to uh, avoid uh, the altercation completely. Avoiding uh, has more to do, even before I see the shadowy figure, don't wander around in the middle of the night. You know, just because you have a gun uh, doesn't mean you ever want to use it, right? So the gun is always the method of last resort. So um, you can't let anybody know you're carrying. You can't let anybody see you're carrying. Uh, you have to completely change the way you dress and act and so forth in order to uh, mitigate that anybody will see you. If you lift your arms, uh, uh, you need to make sure that people don't see your holster and your firearm and your belt. Or if you cross your legs, you need to make sure people don't see the firearm on your ankle. Or if you um, put something on a shelf or or whatnot, you need to make sure someone doesn't see the firearm uh, um, in your shoulder holster. There are, in fact, lots and lots of online classes to teach you uh, how to become comfortable with concealed carrying. Um, the, the secret is, is that nobody notices. The only people who notice other concealed carriers are other concealed carriers and law enforcement officers. Um, law enforcement officers can generally pick someone out and other concealed carriers can totally pick each other out. But, um, laymen, uh, general population who don't know anything about guns, don't know anything about concealed carry, don't know any, don't know anything about where people carry their guns, right? You, um, you have different types of, of, uh, of holsters, right? You have, um, what you see on police officers, which are outside the waistband carry holsters, and uh, there's different types of holsters that are outside the waistband. You've got the duty holster, you've got the, uh, the thigh holster, you've got what's called the paddle holster, you have holsters using the FBI cant, which means that they're tilted uh, much more forward. You have um, cross body draw, you have um, hip draw, you have um, draw from 3 o'clock on your belt to 4 to 5 o'clock on your belt. Um, and then, more likely, you have a thing which is called inside the, weight, inside the weight, waist belt, IWB carry, which is to say that you stuff your, uh, there are holsters that are designed that you stuff in your pants. You stuff them in your pants. There's a little bit of the part that goes over your trousers and loops onto your belt. And you holster your firearm inside the waistband of your pants, your trousers. Um, which means that you need to buy trousers that are a couple sizes too large if you're going to conceal carry. Because you need to make sure that there's enough room uh, along with your torso in your pants so that you can uh, carry a firearm inside your pants. Now, 
there's a bunch of different ways people carry. Um, they sometimes carry on their hip. They sometimes carry on their uh, oblique. Um, you know, that little area between your hip and your butt. Um, some people carry at their appendix. I have a tummy, so there's no way that that's possible. But flat, flat tummied people tend to carry it basically pointing at their groin. Um, there are people who wear sh shoulder holsters. There are people who have kit bags, side bags, butt bags. There are people who carry in their pockets. Um, I have two pocket pistols. And I've carried them in my pockets. Um, you have, I've also carried those pocket pistols in my, on my ankle. Um, I personally carried a very deep conceal. So there's different levels of concealing. So there's, you can carry your pistol very high on your hip. You can par carry it low on your hip, or you can carry it deep in your pants. Um, the pros and cons is that uh, the pro of deep concealment is that nobody will ever really notice that you're carrying. The con is that if you do need to access your firearm during a draw, um, there are chances that you might, um, you might fumble. You might not be able to reach uh, the handle or the grip of your firearm in enough time to make that, uh, that draw clean and viable. So, you're carrying, you're carrying, you need to train and train and train and train and train and make sure that you can quickly and easily uh, go from your holster to your firing position as quickly as possible. Because I, as I said to you, um, you cannot threaten anybody with a firearm. You cannot brandish a firearm. Hey Google, what is the definition of brandishing a firearm? On the website aismanlaw.com, they say, if you brandish, wave around, point at or just display your firearm or deadly weapon in an angry, threatening, rude or offensive manner, you have satisfied this element. So that's illegal. Uh, there are more people who have gone to jail for brandishing. In other words, there was a woman who had a concealed carry permit. And uh, she was the victim of domestic abuse. And her, uh, her spouse came after her. And she, um, she brandished the firearm at him and ended up in jail. Because here's the crazy thing about concealed carry. Nobody's supposed to know that you're actually carrying a firearm until you shoot them in the chest with it. So... It's supposed to be a complete surprise to the to the person that puts their hands on you. So if that person who, if I've done the evading, if I've done the avoiding, if I've done the running, if I've done all those things, and if the person still tries to mug me um, and threatens my life, uh, before they know what happens, I can fire three, four, five, six, seven rounds into their center mass until they stop uh, pursuing me. And they will have not even known that I was carrying in the first place. So, there's no warning. There's no warning like, uh, like um, in a perfect situation, a concealed carry owner is supposed to be a complete surprise to anybody who assaults him. So let's say you just feel like um, attacking the the runt or the dweeb or the geek or whatever. You just All you want to do is have a good Friday night fist fight. You p end up picking on someone and they feel threatened for their life. You will have no warning. There's no expectation of you having to say, stop, I am armed, or anything else like that. Because... In the training, you were taught in no uncertain cases that in the amount of time that you can consider doing any of those things, you can be killed. 
uh, if a person is standing 20 feet away from you and has a knife, in the amount of time that it takes you to draw your firearm from inside of your weight belt, that person can cross that distance and, and stab you in the heart with it. Like there is no time to pause and to consider, which is another promise that you make, is that if you conceal carry, you not only have to be trained, but you have to be uh, willing to commit. And uh, willing to commit means that uh, in a situation, you really want to avoid, 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 avoid. Because what if the person was trying, what if the person had found your wallet and just didn't understand personal distance and was running up to you to give you your wallet or your cell phone? And you consider that to be, as they lift their arm in the dark and you can't discern what they're carrying, you quickly draw and fire into their uh, center mass five times they drop to the ground and there's no firearm. There's just your wallet or your, or your cell phone. Um, in the last moments, you have to avoid, 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 avoid until you feel like there's an existential threat, that if there is a personal threat, not existential, but that there is a lethal, a, a plausibly lethal uh, situation that is coming to pass and you need to uh, you need to just you need to commit to using your firearm if you carry a firearm you need to commit to use it if you're not willing to commit if you brandish if you show if you brag if, you know, there is nothing to stop someone just going, if they have, if they're stronger than you, if they're faster than you, if they're younger than you, if they have a blade, if they have, a, nobody with a blade is, is required to show you that they have a blade. I generally have a, a, a flip knife in my pocket. Um, if I ever get into an altercation, it's going to be a big surprise to the person that I'm fighting that I have a knife on me. I'm not going to go ahead and play uh, when you're a jet, you're a jet all the way. I'm not going to play uh, 1950s uh, musical. I'm not going to play a game of musical like uh, knife fighting. This is not a, a uh, 1950s simulacrum of a gang fight where I, I duel with someone who's also carrying the exact Italian switchblade that I have. There's never ob an obligation. Uh, this is the term is telegraphing your intent. There's a lot of training done by concealed carry people to not telegraph your intent. It's the same like boxing. You want the person to who is boxing you to never know what punches or what combinations you're going to be uh, doing against them because they will be able to defend themselves and parry. The crazy thing about a uh, concealed carry agreement is that nobody knows, nobody knows until the moment you draw and fire. So uh, there's no fait d'attention, there's no, there's no, um, do not attack me, I am armed. It's not like uh, you're walking around like Kyle Rittenhouse was. Kyle Rittenhouse was strapped with an AR-15 on a sling. In no uncertain terms, he was telegraphing himself as a dangerous thing. He was saying, Hi, I am a bright red and blue tree frog. I have poison skin. Hi, I am a crocodile, an alligator, or a shark. I have pointy teeth. Hi, I am a federal agent. I have a big uh, FBI windbreaker, etc. Right? Or I am a SWAT. Or I am a police officer. Or I am an army man. Um, there are ways of telling that someone's concealed carrying. They generally... Uh, dress in general 
uh, all their clothes seem to come from this company called 511, 5.11. Uh, a lot of them wear, you know, as you can imagine, uh, cargo pocket pants, and they wear oversized overshirts to hide, you know, they call them blousing. There's a strategy to avoid, uh, as, I, as I said, you know, you don't want uh, your gun to, um, to display. You don't want it to pattern. Uh, you don't want it to uh, uh, to be visible, so a lot of guys will wear blousey overshirts or long blousey uh, bla- uh, well, blazers are great, but long blousey overshirts, long blousey um, vests, uh, fishing vests, photography vests, anything that are loose fitting and blousey over so that people cannot tell that they're concealed carrying. Um, they generally dress like they're uh, Blackwater Z uh, private contract contractors, or their own little their own little uh, mercenaries. Um, but if you don't know to look out for that, um, you'll never know. And so, uh, picking on someone who looks feeble or older, or a woman, or uh, aged, or slow, or even heavy set or tiny, or skinny, or nerdy, or even, you know, dressed fancy, or um, whatnot. You'll never know until you make a move and find out whether or not you're going to get shot in the chest. So, it's a very interesting thing. Like, like there's no fair warning. It's not sporting at all. Um, If you wander upon a concealed carry person, and you don't know, you can't discern it, you just think that they're an idiot walking alone at night through the street or or whatnot. And the same thing in, in a home invasion. There's no obligation to telegraph the fact that you have a gun in the house. You don't have to, in fact, they tell you not to uh, make the shotgun pump shotgun sound or or make any sound of chambering around or anything like that because the moment someone knows that there's a gun in the house the possibility of them taking it from you and using it against you is extremely high the longer they don't know that there's a firearm in the house the more that you have a an advantage um i guess that's the same reason why they tell you not to let anybody know uh, that you have a firearm on your person as a concealed carry holder um, until you shoot them. Um, and then and then you have to uh, enter the legal system. Um, and, you know, you throw, you throw your dice. You know, in fact, what do they say? Um, better to be judged by, a, by 12 of your peers than carried by six of your friends or, or whatnot. It's like a... Better to be um, better to be judged in the courtroom uh, by a jury than to uh, than to be than to be dead. So that's another interesting thing that I'll tell you after the break. And I'm sorry this is really long. Apparently, I had a lot more to share than I knew. back. This is Chris Abraham. This is Chris Cast, Season 3, Episode 2. This is Guns and Kyle Rittenhouse. So, my buddy is a, I guess he's a federal agent, because he's got a concealed carry that he can carry his gun in any state. Hawaii, California, New Jersey. He's a federal agent, um, and all this other stuff. And, uh, anyway, he's been around the world, uh, working for our government, uh, both in a, uh, government and a non-government positions. And, um, he has told me stories about how home defense 
works in other countries. And I, I believe that many countries in Europe have this concept of proportionality. And I know that proportionality has been something they've been trying to pass in Washington, D.C., which is to say, um, and this is a direct Kyle Rittenhouse reference in terms of the trial, uh, bringing an AR-15 to a, to a, a fist fight. In America, in most what they call free states or states with liberal gun laws and constitutional carry laws and all that other kind of thing, there's no expectation of proportionality. If someone comes into your house and all they have is their hands and they try to uh, put their hands on you, you can shoot them enough times to neutralize them and then stop. If you're on the street and you're a concealed carry holder and someone puts their hands on you in, a, in an aggressive manner so as to put your life in peril, and a good beating, a good beating is a good beating. Don't believe television. People don't just walk away from the kind of beatings that you see on television. People die every day from internal bleeding, from brain trauma, from brain swelling, uh, you know, all the time, if someone gives you a good beating and then gets you on the ground and then, and then kicks you, that even happened in, in my fraternity. I was at, uh, at odds and a, um, a Marine, uh, didn't like the fact that I was talking to his girl and, uh, he challenged me to a fight. And before I knew it, my brothers beat the shit out of him. And to the point where he was on the ground with a with a cuff around his neck, and he was taken away by the by the ambulance. Um, it was brutal, but nobody had any weapons. Nobody had any any billy clubs or blackjacks or anything. It was just a a, a quick attack by a bunch of my fraternity brothers, who were all like private university students, and um, and it was brutal. It was quick. And it destroyed a Marine. A Marine is not e easy to destroy. And he went off in the... He had uh, his neck brace, and he went off in the ambulance. We never saw him again. Um, that is the kind of thing that fists and, and, and knees and elbows and feet can do. I mean, do you watch MMA, right? So there's no obligation, there's no expectation that there's any proportionality. Uh, you attack me with your body, and I shoot you with a gun. In other countries, there is this proportionality. You will go to jail if someone enters your house and tries to attack you with their fists, and you shoot them with a shotgun. That is not sporting. That is not proportional. I guess what you need to do is you either need to put your gun into the safe and then fight them as hard as you can. And then, or I guess, you know, I guess what really this is, is, um, take your, take your lickings like a man. Don't be a coward. I think that was actually something someone said in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial or, or in the discussion before or after it, what was Kyle, I think, in fact, the prosecutor said Kyle Rittenhouse is a coward because um, um, he shot someone who just was trying to hit him with his fists or whatnot. Um, so, unless you take a beating, you are a coward. Uh, and so there's this concept of proportionality. Hey, that wasn't fair. And, and I understand, hey, that wasn't fair, right? Like, it's not fair. You, you see it all the time with the mothers of people, of, of kids who attack someone with their, with their fists, who get into a fight and they choose the wrong person. And the mom or the dad is yelling, uh, he didn't deserve this, he didn't deserve this. But he did because he, he physically assaulted someone. And they couldn't defend themselves. And if they had a gun, they would be able to defend themselves. Um, 
if they were trained plaus- plausibly, presumably, if they were trained and so forth. Like, I think that personally, every single woman who's in a domestic uh, abuse relationship should have uh, a secret pocketbook gun so that when their abusive husband comes home in a rage at night from the bars or whatever and wants to take a beating on her, then she could quickly dismiss him with uh, enough gunshot, enough enough bullets to um, to stop him and then call the police. And, uh, but, you know, that would, that would be a terrible thing because most people in abuse don't want, I mean, they, they respond very badly to when uh, domestic disturbance happens and they oftentimes will shoot the, uh, police instead of their spouse. I mean, even though there's spousal abuse, they're still in love with that person. They're still married to that person and that person might in fact, uh, pay all the bills, so it's complicated, but nobody would say, let's say a woman was being beat by her husband, that generally speaking, that man is beating her with his fists and and knees and elbows and, and feet, right? If that person was able to rush to their bedside, get the, the house revolver and shoot the abusive husband who's beating up on her, uh, I believe that that's legal. I believe that that's legal. I believe that um, there's no expectation. Proportionality should also be that if if I'm um, going to attack you as a six foot three, three hundred eighteen pound, fifty one year old man, you should have proportionally the same ability to defend yourself against someone who could literally kill you with just my body weight. I mean, it's all relative. Uh, that's why they call Um, guns, the great equalizer. Um, but you know, the, here's the things that I don't believe. I believe in so many cases, everything besides the, uh, the righteousness and the legal righteousness, not, not righteousness. Righteousness is wrong. I'm going to come to, I'll tell you about what I think about this, uh, about this, um, Kyle Rittenhouse trial and the accusations and so forth after this break. Hey there, Chris here. Uh, we're going to have a bunch of alarms coming soon. So let me just make this quick and then, and then, uh, and then come back with how you can contact me. I have three minutes. Anyway, so I think that everything Kyle Rittenhouse did was stupid. Like I said, as a concealed carry holder, it's all about being the invisible man. It's all about being what's called the gray man. It's being the guy that nobody pays attention to, the person who you don't know is carrying a gun, the person who you don't know has any money. Like uh, wandering around with a Rolex Wandering around with uh, what a Louis Vuitton bag or or a big um, ring on your finger, or whatever, telegraphing wealth, telegraphing vulnerability, telegraphing that you have a firearm. All these things I try to avoid, and I think in general in the world of concealed carry, they tell you to try to avoid them. Be the gray man. You can do uh, research on. Let me see if um, if if uh, if Google knows anything. Hey, Google, what is the gray man strategy for gun carrying? I don't know, but I found these results on search. Um, uh, this is the simple act of blending into the masses and not looking or acting abnormally. Whether you're in a large crowd or a small group, you should not uh, strive to um, conceal... You, you should try to conceal yourself. The point, uh, the point, the point of this is to avoid uh, showcasing that you're carrying a gun and are trained to use it. So that's what gray men is. So first of all, do not telegraph that you are a trained shooter. 
not a trained shooter, but you are trained with a firearm that you have committed to using it if cornered. Do not telegraph the fact that you... The alarm, the alarm, the alarm. I've got some reminders for Chris and Chris. Sorry about that. It's time for me to take my evening meds, but I will continue on this. So that's the first thing. Do not telegraph the fact that you are carrying. Kyle Rittenhouse was open carrying an AR-15 uh, up and down the boulevard. Up and down the boulevard. It was not just a boulevard either. It was not just at night. It was not uh, in his cul-de-sac. It was not um, at the range. It was not uh, at a picnic with friends. He carried um, an open carry AR-15 that looks dangerous uh, in a uh, in in a in a, a violent in a, in a violent situation. Right? Not not a protest. He was it was day two of a riot. Right? So the night before uh, there was um, more fires. So he came to supposedly defend the car dealerships or whatever. But he broke every rule that I uh, was trained on. Do not telegraph. Do not let anybody know you're caring. Do not walk into trouble. Uh, do uh, Avoid, uh, evade. Um, he eventually did run. He ran and he ran and he ran and he ran and he ran. Then he ended up shooting... And he kept running, running, running again and ended up shooting again. So even though I believe that he was perfectly within his right to defend himself against um, each each attack, I believe, like all y'all believe, that he shouldn't have been there. Um, he was, in so many cases, uh, I would say he was brandishing. Someone would just say he was, he was open carrying. But, um, I don't know. He was, uh, he was walking around naked saying, I dare ya. He was walking around naked saying, I dare ya. He was, he was using a straight razor and then swimming, uh, naked on the Great Barrier Reef. I believe that he put himself in a dangerous situation. I believe that... Um, he was brazen. I believe that he was foolhardy. I believe that he, I also believe that, um, I also believe that the people who he ended up shooting, um, very actively worked on separating him from the herd. He was the runt. Everybody was yelling, he's not going to do shit. Uh, he was very clearly the gazelle, the least, the least strong gazelle that the that the hyenas were trying to pull out from the herd, the herd of those proud boys or bulu boys or whatever they were. Um, he was pulling them away from the herd. They were pulling them away from the herd. They got him into a situation where they could, uh, where they could attack him, maybe take his gun, and uh, they weren't prepared for him to have done that one thing that I told you, uh, which is the commit, which is the commit, that once you're in a situation where you feel like you are about to be painted into a corner, when you're at the point of no return, you are willing to kill another person, you're willing to commit to shoot them in center mass until they stop uh, being a threat to you, until they're neutralized. Um, hey, Google, what is the definition of neutralizing a threat? Here's a summary from the website vocabulary.com. To neutralize something means to make it neutral or harmless. If you are a criminal mastermind and a police detective appears to be amassing the evidence needed to convict you of your crimes, you can neutralize the threat he poses by having him killed. 
That got really dark. That got really dark. Um, so, uh, neutralizing the threat basically means, you know, like I said, if you shoot them once and they turn tail and run, which happens all the time, that threat is neutralized. Um, oftentimes, if they really are enraged and want to hurt you, and then get even more enraged when you, when you shoot them, um... You might have to keep on shooting. And they, they give you all kinds of strategies, which is um, retreat while shooting to make sure that you keep distance. You know, you do not want to move towards anybody who's moving towards you. There's concepts of firing and retreating, um, keeping your, your uh, weapon close to you so it can't be wrangled out of your hand. But here's another thing. There's no expectation of proximity either. Right, because there have been proven, uh, there, there has been proven time and time again that someone who is ten, twenty, or thirty feet away from you, ten meters, can cover that ground in just in, in below, like in just a few seconds, and enough time to prevent you from drawing your firearm. There's not even any expectation. Um, you are allowed to respond to a a deadly threat or a perceived deadly threat, you're allowed to respond to a deadly threat at seven yards away. That's 21 feet away. When you practice shooting for defensive shooting at the range, they make you practice on a seven yard target. Seven yards is in seven feet. Seven yards is seven, 14, 21 feet away. So there's no expectation like, with regards to the Kyle Rittenhouse um, defense, that you need to have the person grabbing your muzzle and basically on top of you before you have to um, resort to uh, deadly force. The person can be seven yards, ten yards away from you. Um, They can't be 30 feet and running away, but you don't have to wait for them to be on top of you before you try to end up in a wrestling match over over your own gun. There's an expectation that you need to respond quickly and efficiently to keep them away from you. Um, You don't know. In the same way that you don't know, they don't know. They're not supposed to know that you're concealed carrying. You're not supposed to telegraph. They're not supposed to know that you're trained with a firearm. They're not supposed to know that you're current carrying. They're not supposed to know that you have muscle memory from your favorite inside the waistband uh, holster towards, you know, your um, your um, isosceles um, position. You're not supposed, nobody's supposed to know anything about that. That's your little secret. Well, their little secret might be black belt or Krav Maga training or uh, time in the military or special forces training or MME. I mean, there's Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Muay Thai classes everywhere. There's a huge amounts of Krav Maga classes. There are a huge number of of karate classes. You don't know. You can't assume that someone is... And even so, let's say they don't know any of that training. They might have tons of roadhouse training. I mean, living on the streets is tough. And I didn't live on the streets. I had a beautiful home. My parents loved me in Hawaii. But I was a white kid in Hawaii. And I was a visitor until I became a kama'aina. And I like moved there when I was six. Nobody knew me. My parents were white. I was white. Like, it's... uh, I don't begrudge anybody for wanting to kick my ass. Um, I would have wanted to kick my ass if I was a local kid and this, like, white Howley kid comes in to town um, and talks all... talks all New Yorker. Uh, I would want to kick his ass, too. And besides, I was a tall kid. I was a big kid. um, I was a strong kid. I was taller by by feet 
for most people. In a world where people are 5'3", I was 6'3". Um, but I learned to fight. I learned to fight with my elbows. I learned to do preemptive fighting. I learned that the moment a kid starts taking off his t-shirt or, or his dress shirt in order to not get blood on it, I knew that that was the time to pounce because, believe it or not, when someone is taking their t-shirt off over their head, they're pretty vulnerable to attack. They should have considered that. Sneak attack from Abraham. But even before karate, I knew how to fight. But I knew how to fight with my elbows, with my with my with my feet, with my knees, with my body weight. You don't know if anybody knows how to do that. So, um, he didn't know what the people he was in. You have to be pretty confident as a five foot four man. You have to be pretty confident to be willing to, unarmed, chase down a guy who's carrying an AR-15. Um, you have to be co- co- confident, or you need to be bloody crazy. And I gotta tell you, crazy is pretty dangerous. And I gotta tell you, um, every war in America, in, in, in European history, up until the 20th century, was won by men who were five foot four. Like, you know, freaking up until the 20th century, you know, men, uh, I mean, even now the average height of a man is five foot nine, five foot ten. That's pretty short, right? So, I mean, five foot four men are more common in the world than six foot three men. And to say that they are um, without recourse, that they do not have a killer instinct, uh, and that they're not willing to use. Uh, the strength and tools that they're expo- expo- at their disposal to decimate, not decimate, but to destroy uh, an opponent is just, is just, uh, I've always taken short guys really seriously because, man, those buggers are willing to commit. Big guys are like pretty used to people not following through, but little guys, man, they scrap. Anyway, I think everything that Kyle Rittenhouse did was pretty stupid. I believe that he felt like he was relatively safe by being amongst his people. I believe that uh, he was intentionally drawn off uh, into vulnerable positions by people who wanted all those guys to be out of there. They were extinguishing dumpster fires. They were putting stuff out. They were uh, counter I don't know if they were counter-protesting, but they were definitely trying to slow down or stop uh, the destroying of vehicles, the burning, all kinds of mayhem. They were trying to put a kibosh on it. Kibosh, kibosh, kibosh. And that was not okay. I mean, there was mayhem to be had. Nobody likes a, um, what is it called, a, a, a wet blanket when it comes to rioting. Um... Uh, what is the term for a buzzkill? Nobody wants a a riot buzzkill. And I think Kyle Rittenhouse and his posse, uh, posse comitatus, his posse, I believe that they were, um, they needed to be, they needed to be neutralized. And um, I believe that Kyle Rittenhouse was the weak link. He was the runt. He was the runt of the litter. He was the, the weakest, slowest, he looked like a he looked like a halfwit. He looked like a kind of a lumpy dumpy. He didn't look like he had a killer instinct. He was the epitome of the gray man. Uh, he was really smiley. He looked innocent, naive, and he was only seventeen and looked sixteen. So when people were yelling at him and yelling about him and saying he won't do anything, I believe that there was a real belief that he was just a a, a dummy and didn't know that he had pretty. Pretty mad skills and a, and a crazy ability to commit. I mean, the level of gunmanship that he produced by being on his back and addressing multiple targets was just, freaking, I couldn't do that. Um, and I don't admire that. But when you look at him, he did not telegraph that. He did not telegraph the fact that he probably did a lot of training, did a lot of prepping, Maybe not live fire training, but he definitely did his sit-ups. 
might have rolled around with the AR-15 a bunch, might have done a lot of training, might have done some, I don't know. His buddies might have put him through a little bit of training uh, to let him know, you know, if you get if you get turtled, if you get on your back or whatever, how to recover. Like, who knows? We don't know how well any of those guys are trained. Most of my friends spend all their time saying that those guys with those guns are just LARPing. But I know that there are thousands of instructors all over the United States. Every gun club has, has a bunch of them. Every range has a bunch of people who are training. There are, uh, there are uh, gun clubs around the southeast, southwest, where people do uh, real-life training, where they run through the desert and they hide behind things. Just go onto YouTube, search out John Wick training or Keanu Reeves training. You'll see that there's these sports called three-gun sports, um, two gun sports, there are, are, are uh, trained events where you have to go through a, uh, um, uh, a complex, you're timed for how quickly you fire at different targets, how you identify targets. These are, these are, these are sports. Um, I, IPCA, is it? Hey Google, what is IPCA? Hey Google, what is IPCA? I found a table on the website acronyms and abbreviations, the free dictionary that probably has your answer. Hey Google, what is gun IPCA? I don't know, but I found these results on search. I don't know. Anyway, there's all different types of sporting events, and all those sporting events aren't just at the... At the uh, I'll be honest with you, when I go to the NRA range, which I haven't done in a number of years... People are terrible. They can't hit the side of a the, the side of a barn. But there's so many of these sports. There's long distance shooting sports, and a lot of these sports are very aerobic, where you have to go through a maze. You have to respond to like just it's basically seal training, you know, where you do uh, or like movie seal training, where you go in and like things pop up and you have to fire and there's uh, friendlies and non friendlies. You have to uh, shoot through cars, you have to shoot out of cars, you have to identify different targets, you have to hide behind something and go around and just all kinds of training. I guarantee you that if this is someone's pastime, they do as much gun training as you do training at the gym to like maximize your deadlift and your bench press and, you know, and your, uh, and your, your press. So I just because they seem like idiots, it looks like they're LARPing around like some, uh, like some medieval times thing. Uh, do not ever underestimate a, a Bubba with a gun. Even if just someone knows how to hunt, I don't know if you realize that hunting in the wilderness, I'm not talking about uh, glamping hunting or, or being on a, a, you know, Trump hunting, going out on a, a, a Land Rover into the Serengeti and like shooting a, um, a gazelle from 20 yards that's been sedated. I'm talking about the kind of white tail and elk hunting that people do, which is basically ultra running, carrying a gun, shooting an elk, cutting up an elk, and then humping it out. Right? That is some, like, uh, just, it's like hiking and, uh, and, and, and farmer carry and, and rucking. It's like everything. So tough. Uh, dorks who do archery. I mean, just go on to the Discovery Channel or go on to Netflix or whatever and, like, look up hunting. Like, it's a crazy, crazy, crazy athletic event. Um, so don't underestimate these guys for being, for looking like a bunch of, of goofballs. I mean, if you've ever seen pictures uh, of dudes in uh, 
in the National Guard or, or um, uh, the Army National Guard or, or the Army Reserve or even pictures of dudes in boot camp or, or deployed, those are the same guys. I mean, I know they're wearing BDUs or whatever it's called, camis, but like they're just they're just same dudes. Don't assume that they're all uh, dudes who are on uh, who are on um, debility, a uh, disability, and who are um, fat and 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 asthmatic and can't run a mile and all these other things because I got to tell you most of these guys are extremely more fit they they don't have sedentary jobs they work on their feet they work with their bodies like do not underestimate uh their training in the same way that they should not underestimate uh Kyle Rittenhouse couldn't understand or I mean obviously if a dude is going to chase him down with just a clear plastic bag and he's got a gun and he's running away, if this guy's going to chase him down, he's obviously freaking Bruce Lee or, or Jackie Chan or, or, uh, or the dude, um, everybody says can like when he does push ups, um, he moves the, he moves the earth, not himself. Um, or Seagal. I bet you Steven Seagal is an ass kicker. I know he seems like a, 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 a comic book nerd, but I bet you Steven Seagal can do mad damage with his body. Um, so anyway, long and short of it, I know this was way longer than I thought. I'm going to upload it now and see what happens. Hope you guys are well. I'll talk to you soon, and maybe there'll be another episode soon. Let me know if you like this, and I'll give you my contact info after the break. break. Hey there, Chris Abraham, Season 3, Episode 2, Chris Cass with Chris Abraham. You can reach me at chrisabraham.com. I'm chris at abraham.su. You can text me at plus one two zero two three five two five zero five one. 352 I'm on Telegram. I'm on uh, Google Chat at cabraham at gmail.com. I'm uh, on Telegram. I'm on Signal. I'm on WhatsApp, I'm on uh, Snapchat, I'm on, uh, I'm at Chris Abraham on Twitter, I'm at Chris Abraham on Instagram, I'm at Chris Abraham on YouTube, I'm at Chris Abraham on Facebook, I'm maybe CJ Abraham on, oh, I don't know, on TikTok. I am let's see on TikTok I am Christopher Abraham on TikTok and uh, uh, my blog is chrisabraham.com slash blog my sub stack is Chris A dot substack.com and what else uh, my tumblr is chris-abraham.com I'm on no agenda social at chris so at chris at uh, no agenda social.com and I think that's it like I like you know um, my home base for this podcast is is anchor.fm slash Chris Abraham. Um, I'm anywhere on social uh, on, on the podcasting world. I haven't done an episode in months, so I apologize for that, but you should be able to find me at any of these platforms. And please, whatever platform you're on or whatever um, uh, player you're using on your Android or iPhone, please click the review button or the rate button Give me five stars or write me a review. Say hello to me uh, at Chris Abraham on Twitter. 
and I'll get back to you in the next one. Talk to you soon. Love you guys. Bye-bye.